Last week when we were studying about premillennialism and noticing that the Bible does not so teach it and that it does not serve as an identifying mark of the church of which we all read on the pages of the New Testament, I mentioned, as we have from time to time, the term Calvinism. Well, you'll notice there's an ism on premillennial and there's an ism on Calvinism. Well, you might keep this in mind as just a rule of thumb. There is no ism of any sort when it comes to true, pure New Testament Christianity. In fact, you cannot separate Christians from the church that Jesus built and shed his blood to purchase. Matthew 16, 18 and Acts 20 and verse 28. In the New Testament, if you lived in the first century, all you would have known would have been paganism, the Jews, if you knew about them, and you would have known about Christianity. There was no denominational setup of any sort. No such thing as premillennialism, no such thing as Calvinism and various other isms that man have derived in the intervening 2,000 years and mainly besides Roman Catholicism in the last 1,500 years. But today we want to emphasize what the Bible has to say about babies being born depraved, having inherited the very sin that Adam committed in the garden as it came down, we might call it spiritual genetics if there was such a thing, through everybody down to this present time. Babies are born pure and innocent rather than depraved. The doctrine of Calvinism has God ordaining before the world was, people being lost, they can't do a thing about it, and people being saved, and they can't be lost. And thus you're born into this world having inherited Adam's original sin. Well, those people that God predestined to be saved, whether they want to or not, our Lord died for and shed his blood to purchase them. He didn't die for those who are predestined to be lost. Calvinism has him dying only for the elect as they define the elect, and that is those who were predestined before the world was to be saved. You can see how in various ways Calvinism is so messed up. That is, if you want to let the Bible be your guide, if you want to study the Bible rightly dividing the word of truth, and we trust all want to have a thus saith the Lord proposition for everything they believe and practice. Infants, the Bible teaches, are born pure and innocent rather than having inherited that sin and are thus depraved. There are a lot of people who believe this view and they don't know really that it's not the Bible teaching. That is, there are those who know Calvinism. There are those who experience Calvinism but they don't really know anything about it being called Calvinism. If you say you believe Calvinism, they may say, well, I, 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 I guess I do. I don't know. But there are a lot of creeds that men have written that teach hereditary total depravity. Now, if you look at any good dictionary, you'll see that hereditary has to do with that which is transmitted or transmissible as a constitutional quality or condition from parents to offspring. And that depravity means the state of being evil, perverted, corrupted. So here is a false doctrine which claims that sinful corruption has been transmitted from the parent, starting with Adam all the way down to us, and that one is wholly inclined to do evil. That's their idea of the fall of man. He's inclined to do evil. That it is inherently impure. That it is 
a child of the devil in that way. Now, the Bible uses terms child of the devil, but not the way the Calvinist does. The Calvinist believes you're a child of the devil because you're born that way. Any child or young one in this auditorium that's beneath the age of being accountable to God for his actions is a child of the devil. That's Calvinism. I suggest to you that's one of the things that even Calvinists really don't like. But that's Calvinism. That babies are born depraved, having inherited Adam's original sin all the way down through their parents. Now, as you well know, one error leads to another, and we're not going to go through, as I said last Sunday afternoon, everything about Calvinism. Now, that's enough right there for our points. So what I want to do this morning is deal with an examination of some of the text out of the Bible that they attempt to use to prove their point and show how that they've twisted it and wrested it from its context. First of all, we'll note Psalm 14. Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3. The Lord, or as the American Standard says, Jehovah, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek after God. They are all gone aside. They are together become filthy. There is none that doeth do good, no, not one. Well, this proves something. It proves that people were and are very wicked. But it doesn't prove and has nothing to say about one being born wicked from the womb. The passage plainly says they are all gone aside. Well, to go aside mean you must have been some other place than aside to be able to go aside. They are together become filthy. Well, there had to be something before they became filthy. They had to be pure for them to become filthy. Filthy. So it would be impossible for them to have gone aside and to have become filthy if they had been born that way. That's true of any sin, since sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. So we become sinners when we're accountable to God for our actions, and we violate God's truths. We either sin by omitting what God said we must do, or we commit sin when we just break God's law, doing that which we should not do. The fact that they went aside, the fact that they became filthy, actually is proof that they were not born that way. Now, I know and you know that there are people who teach that uh, you're born a homosexual, that you cannot help yourself. Well, I'll suggest to you that Calvinism has not in its true teaching, done a whole lot to discourage that viewpoint. Because if one is born a sinner, then why not just say in moral matters, one was born that kind of sinner. If you can be born a sinner in general, why can't you be born a certain and specific kind of sinner? Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible condemns homosexuality. So it's rather obvious God's not going to condemn that which you're not responsible for, which you cannot help. And when you read the letter to 1 Corinthians concerning that particular sin and a list of other sins, he makes it clear that some of the members of the church had been converted from being homosexuals. Well, if homosexuality is something that's not bad, why were they converted from it? Why weren't they still practicing it? No, nobody can believe in the God of the Bible and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the inspiration of the Scriptures and say any sin, whether it's a moral one or whether it's a religious one, is sanctioned by God and certainly not the one that says man is born into sin having inherited Adam's original sin. Now we referred to this one not long ago, this 
one they use as a proof text. Psalm 51 and verse 5, where David declared, Behold, behold I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Well, those who advocate hereditary total depravity assume, underscore that word assume, assume that David was born a sinner. But the passage, as you remember, does not say so. There's nothing in the passage that says so. Sin is mentioned in the verse. But notice the sin mentioned in the verse was committed before David existed. In other words, David did not exist before he was conceived. Some things are rather sophomoric to say the best about it. So the iniquity and the sin spoken of existed before David had his existence. Again, the NIV translates this wrong. And just simply has David conceived in sin. That is, he was guilty of sin. They're teaching there the idea of hereditary total depravity and that babies are born lost, having inherited that sin all the way back from Adam or to Adam. Then we look to the New Testament, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, we find a verse there that's relied on by these people to try to prove their view. And part of that verse reads, speaking of the Gentiles who had been converted and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Well, again, we must write and divide the word of truth. We must understand the definition of words. And words can have more than one definition. There is that which is natural. You're born a male. That's natural. You're born a female. That's natural. Birds hatch from eggs. That's natural. Things that work according to the natural laws is God created those laws and by his word uphold those laws, such as the law of procreation. But nature is also used by the Holy Spirit to mean that this is the way you have done this thing for so long, generation after generation after generation, that it has become natural to you. It's just what you do without any thoughts about it. We might say today, well, that's second nature. That's how we might express it today. And we're meaning the same thing. You've practiced it so long, it's just the way I do it. We'll say it this way, old habits die hard. And of course, we do emphasize that if you're going to have a habit, have a good one. Because habits are not easy to break. And if it's a bad habit, sometimes it's more difficult to break. But when something has been practiced by culture, generation after generation, then of course it becomes natural to them in that sense. Not that they were born according to natural law of procreation in that way. And that's exactly what Paul is saying to those people in Ephesus who made up the church there. They were the Gentile world. Read Romans chapter 1. And those who desired not to retain God in their knowledge, he gave them over to do all these particular things. And that's just what they did. And they did it over and over again. Let me give you a modern day example. Denominationalism. If you mention Christianity today to the average person who knows anything about it, they're going to say, well, of what denomination are you? Why are they going to say that? Because it's natural to them. It has been used for 500 years to refer to Christianity, and that's all some people know. But it's never used like that in their Bibles. Why can't they see it? For the same reason some people don't see what we're studying this morning exactly why we must always be careful yes we members of the church lest we fall into the same trap when it comes to whatever there may be that's going on I'll show you how it works sometimes uh, we've known brother so and so why he married my mama and daddy and he's this that and the other and lo and behold he's teaching a false doctrine but we've been so connected with him that we just can't believe 
that he would teach a false doctrine. Or we have such good friends in the church. We've known them for years and years. They've been friendly to us. We've eaten with them. We've gone out together. We've had fun together. We've gone to parties together. We've all praised one another and shaken hands and enjoyed visiting hither and yon and all over the place. And it's just hard to believe now that brother or sister so-and-so could go wrong. That's why that you've got to have evidence to base your faith on. If not, your feelings take over. And they will overrule your faith. But remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So my faith, when it comes to Calvinism, it's just not there. Why? There's no proof. There's nothing in the Bible that proves it exists. And the same thing then when we talk about by nature here does not mean by inheritance. Does not mean by inheritance. We now turn to another psalm. Psalm 58, 3. Psalm 58, 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born. Speaking lies. Again, this is one we touched upon earlier. Well, I've never seen a baby with such genius that he comes out of the womb speaking lies or speaking anything else. He can sure cry pretty loud and communicate only in that way, but I've never seen speaking words. So this is teaching something, but does it teach hereditary total depravity? Notice that they went astray after they were born. Regardless of how close to their birth you want to put it, they still went astray after they were born. But the doctrine says they're born that way. They were born astray or they went astray? They went astray. Their going astray consisted when they were old enough to think the truth. They're old enough to think a falsehood or a lie. And they can get old enough to speak that lie, and that's what the scripture said they did. Well, infants cannot speak lies. Therefore, the sin was not committed in their infancy. So these are some of the verses that they like to appeal to, trying to prove that babies are born having inherited Adam's original sin, and they're not innocent. I've said Often, and it's not original with me by any stretch of the imagination, that if this is true, this aspect of Calvinism is true, then Jesus should have said, Suffer, little devils, forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. You see, when you get off on one point of what the Bible does not teach, it'll mess you up on understanding other passages if you try to harmonize them. And that's something... I guess you just have to say too many people just don't really study for themselves. Well, let's look at some passages that actually refute further this false doctrine. Again, man became a sinner in youth rather than born that way. The Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For that the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Genesis 8 and verse 21. Thus I know that sometime when a person's a young person, he reaches the age of where he's accountable for his actions, and thus he's accountable to God and he sins. As far as nowadays is concerned, he needs to obey the gospel to be saved. So if man's heart became evil in youth, then he must have been pure before he reached that stage of his young life. Man's spirit has been given to him by his maker. I don't think I know of anybody that would deny who believes in God the Father, Christ, the Bible, and any connection with Christianity that would deny that fact. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returneth unto God who gave it. The writer of Hebrews said that God is the Father of our spirits. Well, if God has given a man a corrupted spirit, 
What kind of a God is that? It's certainly not a God I want to have anything to do with. He's an unfair God. He's a false God. The Bible doesn't present God in this way. There's nothing in the Bible from God that is not designed to fit man as God made man to understand anything. And there's nothing in the Bible when you understand it that's going to hurt man. But look what kind of God this is. You couldn't trust a God like this. Also, an infant is not depraved because God's not depraved. Now this ties into the one we've just been talking about from Ecclesiastes 12.7 that uh, makes it clear that since God is the father of our spirits, then if his spirit has imprinted on our spirit and we're born sinners, something bad wrong somewhere. Paul said in his great sermon on Mars Hill, for we are also his offspring, Acts 17, 28. Well, being the offspring of God, that makes a child not depraved unless God is depraved. And the only depraved God I know of in view of who we're studying about this morning is Calvinism's God. I know they haven't liked it, but at times in dealing with them, uh, I've made it clear the God you serve is a monster. Same thing's true of the Muslim's God, Allah. If you really know what they teach about him, he's not a God of love. They will tell you he's a capricious God. They never know from their doctrine what to expect out of God, Allah, because he may or may not deal with you in a nice way, and they can never be sure. That's the reason that devout, what they call fanatical Muslims, want to die on a jihad because that's the only way they can guarantee they're ushered into paradise, with a guarantee. There's their hope. They know, according to their doctrine, that's all right. But otherwise, they're never sure about God because he's not a God of love. So it helps to understand that it's a reflection on God completely. And that's what the devil wants to do, folks, is to reflect on God. So when a false doctrine is taught, whatever the false doctrine, Calvinism, premillennialism, whatever it is, it reflects on God. That's what the devil does. He reflects on God in a very bad light. Read anything you want in the scriptures regarding the devil and anywhere that you have him dealing with God and he's trying to lower God. Remember Job? Remember what the devil said when he came among the sons of God? God said, have you considered my servant Job? Then described his wonderful righteous character. And what did the devil immediately say? He doesn't serve you because you're God and all that that implies. He serves you because you basically pay him a paycheck. You bless him. And the whole book of Job shows us that innocent people can suffer. And it's not only sin that makes a person suffer. But it also shows that God has created a situation on this earth that helps us through suffering grow and develop spiritually understand a great many things that we wouldn't if suffering wasn't possible well we are his offspring we reflect God in our moral nature because he is imprinted upon us now the Holy Spirit declares that the child shall not bear the iniquity of the parent but if hereditary total depravity is right we do we do it could honestly be said, you are a mean person because your mom and daddy were mean. And they can rightly say, don't stop with us. We go back to our grandparents. And here you go. And then it becomes almost like Adam was in the garden when he said, the woman thou gavest me, she did give me and I did eat. Well, I couldn't help my, the parents I got. Neither could you or the grandparents, the great grandparents, and all the way back. So if you inherited that original sin, Everybody gets to blame Adam and Eve. And of course, that really blames who? It blames God. And that's what the devil does. That's how he operates. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. 
Remember, death is separation. It's not annihilation. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Ezekiel 18, 20. You can have the meanest mama and daddy that ever walked this earth. Make Bonnie and Clyde look like angels. Maybe you know who Bonnie and Clyde is. If not, you just have to go look it up. But if you can think of a very wicked person today, then you put them in the face of Bonnie and Clyde. The point is, you can't blame anybody. Except yourself for your sins. That's what this passage is saying. You can say, my daddy is the most rotten character in the world. My mama's this. Uh, I was raised in an atmosphere of wickedness. You can do something about it. I don't know that anybody has stifled your free will to act. As my mother used to say, you can get up off yourself and get with it. Now, parents, as the Bible teaches parents are to be, as we studied about in class this morning, ought to be helping their children develop spiritually, as the Bible teaches. That doesn't happen all the time. And as we go out to try to preach the gospel to people, you're going to reach a lot of people who haven't had that advantage. Just read some of the list of those that were converted in Corinth, and they're not the kind of people you'd want to hang out with. But they were with them enough to show them the truth of the gospel and they converted, they changed because they repented of the way they thought that was wrong and the way they talked and the way they lived and their evil conduct. And they obeyed the gospel. The Lord added them to the church. So we are responsible for our actions. I think one of the biggest problems in America today is because people want to just, well, let's uh, blame somebody else. You listen to the presidential candidates. Just listen to them. And they're blaming somebody else for everything that's wrong in this country. And they don't ever try to point out the good that a country that is a republic like this one from its foundation has done. But you talk to an immigrant who comes from a country where there weren't those opportunities and they praise this country for what it allows them to do, they could not do where they came from. Well, something's wrong somewhere. But you look at the Lord's church and you look at religion in general. You look at our society and everybody's trying to find some class of people that says there's where the problem is. You know, I was thinking at my age, people... They kind of make humorous to me somewhat, young people in the millennial generations. There's some of them like we call them, millennial this, oh, just get all upset. But they forget, buddy, that we were of that generation called the baby boomers. We had to live with that. You know one reason they forget it? They don't ever think people my age was ever young. They think all those people died in Vietnam War were at least 70 years old. They don't realize that we lived through one of the most disruptive, rebellious stages this nation has ever seen besides the Southern Confederacy rebelling against the United States. They don't realize that we were the baby boomers and from us came the hippies, those marvelous hippies. Some of them call themselves yippies. I never didn't know the difference. But as... Uh, Young person, I didn't go along with that. So you come from, and I don't remember all of them, from the baby boomers, and I don't know what the next one is. You got Generation X, and you got this, that, and the other. What do they call it in the 1980s? I don't know. Anyway, you got all this. Well, why should the millennials be so out of joint because they're referred to as such and such? Some of us are already born the brunt of that. You know what's wrong with people? One thing that's wrong with them is that they can't see beyond the years they've been here. And if they've been here 20 years, that's all the experience they have. 
How are you going to experience what you weren't there to experience? The closest you can do is read the history of it, but that's not like experiencing it. I can read the history of landing on the beaches of Normandy, but I guarantee you it's not like experiencing it. The point I'm trying to get at is that we are responsible for our actions. We were not born sinners. And whatever our generation is, there's several generations represented here. That doesn't make any difference. I don't have to go along with the crowd. As mama used to say to me, well, I guess everybody else jumping off the roof, you're going to jump too. I want, do parents still tell children that? You just don't go along with the crowd. You follow truth, and truth won't let you go along with the crowd because the crowd is very seldom walking with the truth. So if you're going to be a faithful child of the living God as that is defined and described in your own New Testament, you're going to have to stand for the truth and make up your mind rather early. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth while the evil days come not, nor the days draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. I'm going to close on this because it's rather obvious if you believe the Bible that this idea is just simply wrong. Except you turn and become as little children you shall no, no, no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. David said of his dead son, baby son, I will go to him but he will not return to me. But he died a baby. Well, did he die lost? So there's a plan of salvation because man's a free moral agent. Man's born in this world. He commits sin, transgresses God's law. He's separated from God. He needs to have a way back to God so he can truly and honestly call God his father, Christ his elder brother, and those who are members of the church, his brothers and sisters in God's family. He needs to take responsibility for his own life. I don't care whether you had an excellent life in moral and religious upbringing or whether you have it. You are responsible from now on as to what you do. So you have to make up your mind. Choose you this day whom ye will serve, Joshua said. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Until you come to that grip of things, then you're never going to be what you have to be to go to heaven and to give you a better life here on earth. If you're not a child of God, we beg of you to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, and confess your faith in Him, and be buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you've sinned, then would you repent of those sins, humbly come confessing them, and praying God for forgiveness. And that's the way that the Bible teaches for one to become a Christian, and for one who is a child of God to gain forgiveness. You're subject to the Lord's invitation. We invite you to come while we stand and sing.